Hi, everyone. Welcome to the International and Defense Policy Speaker Series. I am Stephanie von Hletke, the director of the CIDP at Queen's University. And I'll start off by being honest. We initially organized this panel thinking it would be a good opportunity to share some research on NATO. Since organizing this panel, Russia launched a full-scale military invasion of Ukraine. It has been certainly devastating to witness. And while Russia is waging war in Ukraine, you have heard from our CIDP fellows, they have lent their expertise in the media. And today we get to have more time with them to ask about NATO in 2022 from different allied perspectives, uh, but very much taking into account the events of the past week. And the real reason for getting us together is uh, Dr. Luca, Rati, who's spending some time in Canada right now, uh, and we're uh, very delighted to be able to have our CIDP fellows uh, join him in this conversation. We have a one hour session today, and we have two main speakers and a discussant. After that, we'll have some time for Q&A. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Joel J. Sikulski, who is a professor of political science at the Royal Military College of Canada, former principal of RMC, and of course, a fellow at the CIDP. His uh, recent books have covered topics like NATO, NORAD, and civil military relations. Uh, Luca Ratti is Associate Professor of History of International Relations at the University of Roma Tre and Adjunct Professor of International Relations at the American University of Rome. He's uh, currently visiting Professor in European Security at Carleton University, and his research and teaching interests lie in U.S.-European relations, NATO's evolution, European security and defense policies. Then we have a discussant, Professor David Hagland. He is a fellow at the CIDP, but also a former director of the center. He is a professor of political studies at Queens, and he uh, will be going third after uh, Dr. Skolsky and Professor Ratti uh, with his uh, comments right before we open things up for the Q&A. So, uh, Dr. Stokolsky, I'll let you lead things off for about 12 minutes. Thank you so much for being here, all three of you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Well, as Stephanie said, uh, things have changed since we uh, uh, scheduled uh, this, this, uh, this talk. Um, and uh, as far as, uh, as, far as uh, we're concerned, you can see the, uh, uh, the commitment of, uh, of more forces uh, to the enhanced forward presence in uh, Latvia, um, the uh, increase in uh, forces on standby, and the uh, allocation of, uh, of, of uh, more aid for, for Ukraine. Um, and I think all of this uh, shouldn't be surprising uh, given Canada's general approach to NATO, but in particular, uh, given the approach uh, uh, in the last few years, uh, because from the time of the uh, Trump administration, um, and uh, particularly since this, the Russian attacks on uh, uh, and seizure of, of Crimea, um, you've had a leaning forward with uh, uh, being the framework nation for the enhanced forward uh, presence uh, in Latvia, uh, contribution to the training of Ukrainian, uh, of, uh, of Ukrainian forces. Uh, so I think these commitments already reflected the government's, uh, Canadian government's uh, commitment to NATO, its concern during the Trump administration uh, that the alliance uh, might unravel. Uh, and with it would go uh, a major part of the country's uh, foreign and uh, foreign and defense and defense policy. Um, uh, the fact that uh, the country is contributing is consistent with its approach to European security uh, since 1949. Um, the recognition that uh, although it may be called, uh, you know, a multilateral alliance, transatlantic. Uh, NATO is all about uh, Europe and European security, uh, and it's all about uh, uh, being based on uh, being based on American leadership. So again, you see the government stepping forward, uh, uh, supporting uh, 
supporting the, these, these concepts. Uh, consistent also with this approach um, is the, uh, the government's, um, uh, you can say going along, but support for the uh, allied consensus uh, as, it, uh, as it emerges, uh, as it emerged. So you don't see an alternative uh, approach to the, current, uh, to the current crisis, one that's, uh, one that's highly, uh, highly supportive of what the other of what other allies are doing, both militarily uh, and in terms of the uh, the financial uh, uh, penalties that are now being imposed uh, imposed on on, on Russia, um, and I think it, it again uh, indicates the centrality of NATO in uh, in foreign and defense policy, uh, and the and this has been particularly the case um, uh, in the in the post Cold War era where surprisingly uh, the country has been more active in NATO than it had been uh, previously, beginning in the Balkans, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Libya, and up to the more recent operations in Ukraine uh, and the uh, 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 Ukraine and, uh, and Latvia. Um, so it reflects, I think, a deep-seated commitment uh, to the alliance, a concern uh, that if the alliance uh, does not remain uh, allied, um, it'll undermine uh, much of the basis for uh, national security uh, policy. Um, and uh, in, in some sense, the, 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 uh, the most recent uh, response uh, is similar to patterns that we, we've seen all along. You have the creation of the alliance, uh, and then uh, suddenly the Korean War bumps up the price of commitment. Um, uh, when detente waned, you had another surge of uh, activities. Uh, for for Europe, and then in the even in the post Cold War era, when when the Cold War ends, uh, you had another surge uh, having to do with the operations uh, in in the Balkans. So all of this, I think, is uh, is consistent with uh, with with uh, broad for, foreign policy, um, and one that I think uh, also has broad uh, public public support um, with regard to how much is spent on NATO. You know. Even before um, uh, government made it clear it wasn't going to reach the two percent uh, solution, but at the same time, um, the uh, the level of contribution even before the current crisis uh, was significant in terms of the relative contribution that was being made um, to these uh, to these operations. I don't know if this meant. Uh, punching above your weight. I don't think any boxer ever gets into a ring where the weight category is above your weight. Um, uh, but it does, uh, it does reflect a desire to be active. And the other thing, and uh, you can see it now, and this was also in the immediate years previous, um, uh, for people who worried that uh, it was not enough, the contributions would never be enough, um, NATO has never turned back a Canadian contribution. Uh, and so, uh, uh, it was quite. It, it, uh, it was something that could be managed uh, within the reduced defense budget. Uh, but now, however, um, the price has gone up. Uh, active commitments in in a crisis in a crisis area, um, and so uh, as before, uh, the government's being being asked to live up to its to its commitments. And I would say, by and large, it is uh, it is doing that, and this reflects. Uh, the commitment to the alliance going back to 1949, and in particular, the recommitment to the alliance uh, beginning uh, during the Trump administration. Uh, so all of this should not be surprising, but it is, um, uh, it is something that is characteristic uh, of, of policies toward NATO uh, going back 70 years, uh, 70 years or more. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Joel, and I, I'm happy you raised that question of the 2% because we saw Germany's announcement over the weekend about meeting the 2% henceforth, so hopefully we can get back to that in the discussion portion. But let me turn next to Dr. Rady, uh, who uh, will also be speaking between 12 and 15 minutes uh, with his take on where NATO is in 2022 uh, and how the events of the last week have uh, changed a lot of things. Dr. Rady. Thank you, Stephanie, and uh, thank you to Queens and to the organizer for having me here. It, it is a great pleasure to be able to speak uh, 
at this event. Well, uh, I will uh, maybe begin with a, with a label that somehow has, uh, has very often been associated with Italy, and I, and I will try to, to place the events of the last week and Italy's role within uh, the current situation in, in historical context. Very often, Italy was looked upon as a, an unreliable ally. As a country that somehow would not be willing to punch above its weight in, in times of crisis and uh, throughout the history maybe didn't demonstrate like a firm commitment to alliances if anything even switch sides during conflicts and uh, this is a i would argue like um, a label that somehow was part of italy's perception the way in which italy was perceived in 1949 when uh, when nato was created and I have to say, Canada was um, among the countries back in those days, together with the United Kingdom that was very, very doubtful about Italy's ability to make a significant contribution to transatlantic security. Now, today, we are in a radically different situation. And although similar doubts have emerged once again in, uh, in the run up, I would say, to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and uh, maybe in the immediate days after the beginning of the invasion, we also have to say that Italy is making and has made in the last 30 years since the end of the Cold War a huge contribution, I would say, to NATO's operation and NATO's transformation. And uh, Italy participates, for example, in the NATO's enhanced forward presence in the Baltics. Italian forces are deployed in Latvia right, after, right under the Canadian command. In May, Italy will assume the lead of the NATO training mission in Iraq. And uh, roughly the country has deployed between 10 and 20 12,000 soldiers during the last 30 years in peacekeeping and peace management operations under the lead of the Transatlantic Alliance. So I have to say Italy's commitment to NATO certainly can no longer be called into question these days. Despite there are some political forces within the country that may be partly sympathetic, I would argue, to, to Russian narratives. So we have a country that has certainly made now a name for itself as a key security provider in Europe rather than a security consumer as the country was perceived for, for a long time during the Cold War. But we also have a country that traditionally has had very strong ties to Russia. And let me recall here like uh, three historical events very, very briefly. In uh, 1909, right after Austria next Bosnia-Herzegovina, so in the run up basically to dynamics that led to the eruption of War One, Italy signed up with the then Russian Empire, an agreement in the Italian town of Racconigi, in which the two countries declared a willingness to cooperate against any hegemonic ambitions in the Balkans by Austria and Hungary. So this gives you already a little bit of an idea of how Italy never perceived of Russia as an existential threat, and as the two countries managed to build a durable cooperation with, with one another. In 1941, when uh, Mussolini somehow reluctantly agreed to participate in the German-led invasion of uh, the Soviet Union, well, there was a lot of disagreements among uh, even the same fascist leaders and, and the same Mussolini would have certainly preferred to concentrate the Italian effort in the Balkans rather than sending Italian forces in, into Russia. And at the outset of the Cold War, when the government led by the Christian Democrats, especially by Prime, Prime Minister de Gasperi, lobbied heavily for NATO membership, well, we certainly remember that a great, great part of Italian public opinion, the voters of the PCI, the Italian Communist Party, and the voters of the Socialist Party would have preferred Italy to remain neutral in the new Cold War. And as soon as the taunt that was mentioned by Joel, certainly like developing Europe in the late 50s and early 60s, Italy ran to develop its own Eastern policy, making a name for itself as a country that would, would have loved to build bridges with the Soviet Union and somehow overcome yeah, the Cold War and, and the Iron Curtain in Europe. In 1960, a socialist, prime minister, a socialist president, Gromke, Giovanni Gromke, visited Moscow, creating somehow anxiety among its own allies. And in 1966, Fiat, the Italian car maker, opened together, well, with Russian interlocutors, like a famous factory in a, in a city that was renamed somehow in honor of the Italian communist leader, Palmiro Togliatti, Togliatti Grad, back, back in those days on the Volga River in the Samara Oblast. And, the city retains that name called Togliatti even today. So just to give you an idea that the country certainly also has had very close ties to Russia and more recently, I'm sure you must be familiar also with a close personal friendship that certainly link Vladimir Putin to a long serving Italian political figure, Silvio Berlusconi since, since the early 2000s. 
Well, at the same time, let me recall another historical event. 1855, during the Crimean War, Italy didn't exist as yet, as I say, but the Kingdom of Sardinia, Piedmont was already like trying to create the conditions to bring about Italian unification when called upon by the British and the French to intervene in the Crimean War against the Russian Empire. Well, P Piedmont didn't back didn't bulk in a sense, and in 1855, he sent a contingent, contingent of roughly 80,000 men to defend the Ottoman Empire against the Russian aggression. So what does this tell us, in a sense, historically? That Italy's commitment to multilateral security cooperation has very, very deep roots. And the current threat that Russia poses, maybe not directly to Italy, but to the European security order, so it's an existential threat to the European security order, has led the current government, the current prime minister, to make clear that Italy will not somehow bulk, will not somehow be doubtful, but will certainly commit itself to the alliance. And we've seen this happening with a clear cut, let's say three major decisions, to keep bolstering Italian forces in the Baltic, to keep bolstering Italian forces in the multinational division in Romania and Southeastern Europe, and also the decision approved a few days ago by the Italian chambers to send military equipment to Ukraine. We don't have still the details of what type of equipment will be sold. Some of it will probably be kept secret, but I think it is a clear cut commitment of Italy's support for the alliance. But let, let me say though one more thing. This certainly, this commitment to NATO doesn't eliminate what is a, a clear concern for Italian decision makers within NATO. Italy has always looked at the alliance as a guarantor of stability, especially since 1989-1991, in areas that were very close to Italy's borders. So the end of the Cold War radically transformed the European security environment and we face Italian decision makers no longer with the risk of a war alongside yeah, the Iron Curtain or the East-West Division, but we face Italian decision maker, makers with a transforming hybrid security scenario, one in which the risk was of local wars, interethnic wars, implosion on neighboring states that could certainly have very wide repercussions on Italy, be in terms of energy disruption, be in terms of migration, or be in terms even of regional, persisting regional conflicts. And certainly Yugoslavia they gave a very, very good example of this fear in the early 1990s. So did Albania, although we certainly didn't have in Albania an interactive war, but the internal implosions that somehow shaped Albanian history in the early 1990s, and more recently, the collapse of the, of the Libyan regime in which NATO was involved. And Italy supported NATO's operations in all these areas, from the Balkans to North Africa. But at the same time, it retained our concern about preserving stability in those regions. And it is in this context, I believe, that Italy's relations with Russia, they deserve to be evaluated from a different lens. Certainly in this case, we have a, a huge commitment by the country to look at Ukraine as a country that has been under attack by Russia and that needs to be supported with all possible means. But at the same time, we have had a long Italian tradition from the early 1990s to today for making sure that somehow Russia would not be fully marginalized in the European security architecture, but could give its contribution to the stabilization of those countries. In the early 1990s, right after the Bosnian war, when NATO put pen to paper to its process of enlargement, for example, Italy was reluctant to bring right away into the NATO's fold countries such as Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic would have preferred instead NATO enlargement to be somehow addressed to the countries of the Balkans regions, believing that in that area, creating tension with Russia would have been less likely, and also looking at the Balkans as an area that may be at a clear priority position in terms of Italian security interest. At the same time, Italian diplomats, not only the Prime Minister Berlusconi himself, but certainly like the center-left Prime Minister Romano Prodi, the Italian foreign ministers, or the then head, more specifically, of a and political advisor to both Berlusconi and, uh, and Prodi, Umberto Vattani, they went a, a long way to try to build bridges with Russia, first with Yeltsin, then with Putin. 1997, NATO Russia found, signed the founding act of mutual relations, 
but more significantly, right after 9-11 in 2002, somehow Berlusconi that had met Putin at the GA summit in Genoa in 2001 for the first time, presenting himself as the guy that would truly be able to allow Russia and NATO to sit at the same table with the signing in Pratica di Mare of the famous NATO-Russia Council. This commitment has continued in the following years, although when called to make a choice, Italy, like now in the case of Ukraine, has confirmed its clear cap support for transatlantic security cooperation. And I think, yeah, 2002, 2003, when NATO's divisions mounted over Iraq, gave us a clear cut example of, of the Italian position. Although maintaining a dialogue with Russia, Berlusconi didn't hesitate somehow, and he put Italy firmly into the Atlantic camp alongside the United Kingdom and alongside the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, although being heavily criticized then by both domestic opposition and by finally a German government and a French government led by Chirac and, and by an infamous now German personality, Gerhard Schroeder, for its decision to side substantially with the United States. From then on, the country made, has made a huge commitment to the reconstruction and stabilization efforts in which NATO has been involved, to ISAF in Afghanistan, to Iraq, especially in terms of the Iraqi reconstruction and of the training of the Iraqi forces, but at the same time, has tried as far as possible to keep alive this dialogue with Russia. And NATO's approval of a new strategic concept in Lisbon in, in 2010, where Reyes kept open the possibility of dialogue with Russia, it certainly reflected the Italian view. And my, my position, my, my fear is that how NATO acted in Libya in 2011, overthrowing the Gaddafi regime, but then not making a huge contribution to the country's stabilization, somehow increased for Italy the need to keep open dialogue with Russia. Libya ended up in a situation of turmoil, in a situation of instability. The flow of energy was certainly disrupted. Italy's dependency on Russian energy imports ended up achieving 40% of the total imports that Italy has in terms of energy. So this created more dependency on Russia at the time of American disengagement from Europe. But at the same time, it created more dependency, more need for NATO at the time when the United States with a so-called Obama doctrine was calling into question its commitment to stabilize those parts of Europe or at least the Mediterranean as far as Italy is concerned. So I would argue that this situation hasn't, hasn't changed today. Italy's commitment to the alliance is firm and despite the positions of some political forces that somehow, as I said, remain partly sympathetic maybe to Russian grievances towards NATO, it will certainly not be weakened by the current war. And if the war continues, I think Italy will remain certainly, certainly firmly within, within the NATO camp. But there is also like a persisting Italian interest to strive for dialogue with Russia to avoid the risk that the war may be expanded, to avoid the risk that, for example, the Balkans may be rain flame as a result of what is happening in Ukraine. And there is an overall concern about the role of Europe into this. So, from the ambition to create areas of stability alongside Italy's borders in the Balkans, in the Mediterranean, and let's bring this as far as the Black Sea. Today, Italy risks being surrounded by areas of instability. So this is a, a persistent concern of Italian diplomats. And the fact that we are seeing talks on maybe China having to negotiate to bring about a ceasefire or a solution to the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, I think is emblematic in the Italian standpoint of how Europe has been terribly lacking in this crisis. The attempts by Macron, by Scholz to broker a deal with Putin have failed terribly. Even Prime Minister Draghi that had contemplated the prospect of going to Moscow himself was forced at the last minute somehow to step, to renounce to this possibility. And this leaves Europe substantially in a limbo because the perceptions from Italy is that certainly the Americans are needed, but it is clear cut, as David was telling us, that there will not be a no-fly zone, and that for the time being, providing weapons to the Ukrainians is certainly a stopgap solution, but is somehow allowing the Ukrainians to be left alone or to be massacred at the front. So the long-term need to which Italy will aspire 
is one of our political solution. And I believe that in, in the future weeks, we will see Italy's commitment to NATO remain strong. Italy's solidarity with Ukraine certainly not being called into question, but I wouldn't be surprised if Italian decision makers will continue to strive for finding a political solution to the crisis. Although I believe that it may be somehow too late and that Europe may already have lost too much ground into this conflict. So to conclude, we have a country here that has certainly demonstrated this long-term commitment and consistent commitment to the alliance. But also we have a country that still feels exposed to the risk of instability re-emerging in Europe, great power competition re-emerging in Europe in the 21st century. And we have a country that alongside NATO, I believe sees an existential interest in the need to empower more Europe in the transatlantic security architecture. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Luca. Uh, you've touched on so many points that I already see reflected in the question. So I know we'll uh, have a very dynamic discussion session. And I also want to underscore how important it is to bring in some of those historical elements to bring things into the, the greater context. Uh, and no doubt we'll be returning to that critical junctures of the 1990s where uh, when enlargement um, discussions were, were undergoing and eventually led to uh, the expansion of NATO eastwards. Uh, next, we have uh, Professor David Hagland, who will provide some discussant comments uh, based off of uh, Dr. Skolsky and Dr. Reddy's uh, excellent presentations. David, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Stephanie, for the invitation and Joel and Luca for the presentations. I won't take much time. Uh, there's a lot of questions and I know we all want to get to those. I'll just make a few comments that, as Stephanie uh, says, build upon things that both Joel and Luca have, have, have brought up in their presentations. Uh, uh, before I do specific, uh, specifically get to Joel and Luca, I'll put a question on, on the table to everyone. Is, uh, I mean, it sounds strange, uh, it might even sound uh, deranged, but I'm beginning to think that uh, 224, that is to say the 24th of February of this year, is it going to turn into a bigger deal than 9-11 turned into? And we all knew, know how traumatic 9-11 was for international security and US foreign policy. Since I'm teaching US foreign policy, uh, I'll just focus a little bit uh, before the, the two questions I put to Joel and Luca, and, and I'll stop talking, on the transformation that has happened. Uh, no one would have expected to uh, see that uh, the Biden administration would turn into such a, uh, a stellar champion of the notion of transatlantic solidarity. One would have expected to see that the Biden administration would have followed in the footsteps of the Obama administration, uh, which most people will remember, had the view that, well, Europe is basically solved uh, and that it was time to address the next challenges emerging uh, from the point of view of American grand strategy. And those challenges were not gonna come from the Atlantic, but rather from the Pacific uh, theater. And so we had the, the so-called pivot to Asia that uh, the, I have to admit, and I'm sure Luca will, will second this, uh, uh, discombobulated a lot of Europeans because they saw the pivot to Asia as representing a, well, Luca used the word disengagement of the United States from uh, transatlantic security. I think what the pivot to Asia really represented was a desire to get out of the Middle East, to get out of the forever wars. Uh, uh, but it was read, I know, in Europe as constituting almost a, a, an American withdrawal from Europe. It was a relative reconcentration, uh, obviously, of the United States uh, away from Europe, but not anything approaching a total concentration. And what we've seen as a result of 224 has been a return to the notion uh, that uh, transatlantic security is a fundamental bipartisan issue in American politics. There aren't many issues, as everyone knows these days, that can be said to uh, uh, invoke a bipartisan response. Uh, in, in a couple of years ago, the only time uh, that President Trump got a, an ovation on, in his State of the Union, you know, Union address was when he invoked the specter of China as a threat to the United States. Left and right could agree on that. And uh, in President Biden's State of the Union address, uh, the most um, uh, well-received bipartisan comments were the comments directed uh, against uh, uh, Russia's war on Ukraine. Uh, the House uh, significantly passed a resolution condemning the Russian invasion, 
by a vote of 426 to three. The only uh, holdouts being people who are committed isolationists, uh, uh, um, um, Matt Rosendale from Montana, Paul Gosar from Arizona, and Thomas Massey of Kentucky. All of this is to say that the United States, if, if people thought that under the Trump administration, the United States was committed to isolationism, I think they were overstating uh, the uh, intent of Trump's um, uh, rather undiplomatic uh, pressure tactics placed on, on the allies. If Donald Trump, God forbid, uh, were to channel Grover Cleveland in, in two more years and become the only president ever to serve eight years uh, non-consecutively, uh, I doubt that the Europeans will find uh, the second coming of Donald Trump to be the uh, arrival of Charles Lindbergh in the, in the White House. It won't be an, isol uh, an isolationist president. Uh, it will be a president who senses that the, uh, the, the times have changed, that the emotional mood in the country has changed, and that the, the, uh, the benefit of um, being seen uh, to be Putin friendly uh, uh, no longer exists for anyone except for uh, a, a few on the, on the fringes of, of the far right in the United States. And even in, in Europe, uh, uh, you're, you're finding far right politicians, uh, Matteo Salvini, uh, Eric Zemmour, uh, Marine Le Pen, who are reassessing their former love affair uh, with uh, Vladimir Putin. So something big is happening. And then the, uh, the question is, what are the implications? If we are to credit uh, Vladimir Putin's threat to blow up the world the other day, uh, if he is prepared to use nuclear weapons, then that will uh, uh, no doubt challenge the resolve of some of the countries living closest to uh, the, the Russians. But given the, the, the facility with which warheads can be moved at great distance at great speeds these days, it will challenge everyone's resolve. So to Joel, I uh, put the, the, the question of to what extent do you think that um, uh, we all know no one is going to in the West intervene militarily uh, in the Ukraine war? We want to support Zelensky, uh, but we won't be willing to run a terrible risk. But to the extent that a, a NATO ally in the Baltics or somewhere else is actually transgressed by the Russians, to what extent do you think a Canadian support will remain firm for vigorous action? Uh, and to Luca, well, similar question, but. Uh, a uh, modified by, since we're talking about a nuclear war, modified by uh, concern about whether the Italians have been um, uh, following debates in France in recent years about the possibility of France's nuclear deterrent becoming a, um, a, a, a an extended deterrent, a nuclear umbrella for other European countries. And those would be my two questions to the two of you. Excellent. Well, I think, uh, thank you, David, uh, for being such an excellent discussant and, and right away getting the discussion going with these two questions. I think we can ask uh, Joel and Luca uh, to answer those questions right away. And then what I'll do, since we already have 10 questions and counting, is that I will work to group those questions and then pose them to the panel and then whomever wants to respond can. Uh, but first, Joel, please, uh, if you'd like to, to answer David's question. Yeah, I think the risks are already being run. Uh, they were run when, uh, during the deployment to uh, Latvia and the increase uh, uh, to Latvia and placing the forces on standby uh, for, for NATO. That I don't think an independent decision not to run risk is going to work. This is the reality of what the, alli of what the alliance is. And on top of that, I think it's, um, it's sincere. Um, uh, it's being drawn back into, into Europe. Um, and the fact that other allies are being prepared to run greater risk is going to condition the, the, response, the response from here. So I, I think it's a question of solidarity, um, perhaps trying to shape the decision, although there's not a lot of scope for, independ for an independent approach. And I don't think the government expects to uh, expects to have to uh, to have one, you know. I would say, you know, that, you know, just with re because this affected the Biden administration, and and uh, this line has been used before. Uh, the Biden administration is like Michael Corleone. Uh, every time it tries to get out, it's being pulled back in, and I think that's the same. Uh, that's the same here, and it's being pulled back in because uh, of the importance. Of what's at stake, uh, what's at stake uh, in 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 Europe. 
it'll still have the option of, of modulating the commitment, but relative to what's there on the ground, um, the commitment I think has already been made. Thanks, Joel. And Luca. David, thanks for the question. Well, I'll begin by saying that uh, in um, at the end of November 2021, 26 November, Italy and France, they signed up to this bilateral treaty, the Treaty of Quirinale, with a visit in Rome by President Macron, in which they committed to deepen security cooperation and, uh, and again, work for like uh, more Europe, also in terms of uh, security and defense policy. But let me also tell you that traditionally, this Franco Italian cooperation has, has been very odd. And the Italians have always retained a degree of suspicion towards. Uh, French initiative, when, especially when French presidents have, have spoken in the name of Europe. You certainly know this could be traced back to the days of the goal when the goal asked for NATO to be reformed and he called for a triumvirate, which Italy will certainly be no part. And certainly this can be linked to the days of uh, Mitterrand, 1990, when NATO was being transformed and Mitterrand proposed more Europe as an alternative to NATO. Actually, the positions of Mitterrand, to go back to what Stephanie was saying earlier, were very close to those of Gorbachev. Mitterrand called for maybe NATO to be disbanded and to be replaced by a European security and defense compact, maybe anchored to the Western European Union. And Italy was very, very cautious then. And again, it preferred to align with the United Kingdom. Getting rid of the United States, getting rid of the US presence in Europe would be too much of a risk. Again, in the 1990s, when debates were starting about reforming the United Nations Security Council, the Italians advocated, this is the time for Europe truly to get together, CFSP, let's have like a European seat in the Security Council. And I believe France itself was rather cool about that proposal. So I, I think that the bottom line is that without political integration in Europe, any French proposal aim at somehow co-sharing at least nominally, yeah, the nuclear deterrent with the other allies, they leave a little bit of uh, skepticism among Italian decision makers. And uh, this doesn't mean that Italy will not or will not welcome that prospect, but without significant political steps towards closer cooperation in Europe, maybe not among all the 27 members, maybe a restricted group of countries, including certainly Italy and France, that prospect is going to remain just like uh, wishful thinking for the time being, to be, to be frank. Thanks. Well, actually, that's a great segue into uh, first uh, round of questions, because uh, we have a first question asking if isolating Russia will improve European security, so will act as that impetus for deeper European cooperation on, on security and defense matters. And we have another attendee asking if the EU will evolve into a viable defense and security player and dovetail with NATO in a strategic autonomous force. So two questions that relate. Luca, to what you just said. Uh, so I think you've, you've begun to stake a position on this, but let me turn to, to Joel and David as well to see if they have something to add on that. You want me to start? Um, on the question, on the question of European autonomy, uh, my sense, and again, I'm sitting here in Kingston, Ontario, uh, and the crisis, the war starts a week and a day ago. Uh, my sense is for the moment, there is a, a, an agreement between the European Union and NATO that they've worked out the best uh, division of labor that they've been able to achieve. Uh, 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 faute uh, uh, de mieux uh, over the last uh, uh, 15 or 20 years where Europe concentrates on what it does best, which is to apply economic clout uh, to the resolution of the diplomatic crisis. And NATO is seen to provide the, uh, the, the guarantor, uh, military guarantor, guarantee. So for the moment, you would think that there are these, this heightened, uh, uh, proclaimed uh, widely solidarity in transatlantic relations might bode well for the project of uh, European autonomy, but the problem is that the reason that the European autonomy balloon has taken off in the last few years had a lot to do with some countries' distrust of Donald Trump's administration, and it was their belief that they couldn't rely, and they may be correct on uh, uh, in this belief, they couldn't rely on, on America to backstop their security, so that the, the momentary bliss in uh, transatlantic relations where the two big Brussels-based institutions are now 
in one of those rare moments where they're on the same page could actually uh, not bode well for the cause of European security and defense autonomy. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, uh, but I think that uh, that's what's going to happen. Yeah, I, uh, I tend to think that if anything, uh, with this reassertion of American leadership, it's going to diminish the prospect of any kind of independent European, European approach. When President Biden was running for office, he made clear that he was committed to NATO, uh, but also that it was a NATO uh, uh, with American leadership. As he said, the world doesn't organize itself. The United States uh, has to. So I think if anything is going to come out of this, it's going to put an independent European uh, concept of security uh, further, down, further down the road. Uh, because Biden, as David says, has, uh, has come forward, the United States has come forward uh, in, a, in a familiar way that I think the Europeans, whether NATO or the, uh, uh, or the European Union, it, it is familiar with. And Luca, I don't know if you have anything to, to add or additional fresh takes. Yeah, I, I, do, I do agree with both David and, uh, and Joella, but I, I, would, I would like to add this is a very, very tricky time for Europe because uh, the US has reasserted its political, let's say, engage, engagement or leadership in Europe, but the war will have to be fought by the Ukrainians or by European volunteers. So NATO certainly is there to defend its members, but Ukraine is, is being left somehow alone at the front. And I, I don't think Europe can do much, especially when there is no such a political Europe able to act. We may have seen our reassessment of solidarity among, uh, among European members, but we also have uh, maybe different levels of, uh, of solidarity. So I doubt we will see like uh, more Europe coming in terms of military security and defense in, uh, in future years. The, the division we need will, will probably remain. And uh, it is especially worrying to me though, Europe's lack of diplomatic clouds in the in the crisis even the normandy format proof in which france and germany were playing like a, a great role proved unable to stop uh, russia fr from invading so how can we talk about uh, european security and defense when there is no capability to act unanimously politically thanks uh, to all three of you i want to turn next to some questions that look at the past to see exactly where things went so wrong? What was the critical juncture in time? Uh, so there's one attendee who's asking about the 1990s specifically. Uh, could more have been done in the 1990s to bring Russia into the Western fold? Or did Putin ruin any progress made under Yeltsin and prevent any meaningful integration after 2000? So that's one. Then another critical juncture we can look at is 1994 with the Bud Budapest Memorandum. Uh, what do we make of that now in hindsight of the assurances that were made and then the credibility of future assurances that were made by the countries that participated in that negotiation process? And then finally, 2014 and Crimea. Uh, the reaction now is different because the actions are different. But, you know, in hindsight, now looking at Crimea in 2014, uh, should the reaction on behalf of uh, Western players been more forceful? Uh, who would like to go first? I can go first. Okay, sure. Yeah, on the 1990s, could more have been done? Um, you know, it's easy to second guess the decisions that were taken in the past for motives, for reasons that aren't what people think the motives must have been uh, at, the, at, at this current juncture. Uh, the Russians uh, believe, and apparently they believe, and I'm not sure whether they truly believe this, but they say that uh, NATO's expansion has been a threat to their physical security and it was intended all along as a means of containing Russia. I used to spend a lot of time in Europe back in the early 90s and hanging around with people debating NATO enlargement. And my impression was that there were very few security hawks back then who thought expanding NATO was a good idea because it would keep the Russians down. The, the argument was not that NATO should expand for reasons related to traditional Cold War concerns, but that NATO should expand for reasons related to liberal international beliefs and the necessity of expanding the transatlantic zone of peace and that it would be beneficial to all if NATO could be, be were able to bring into its uh, embrace countries that had once been part of the Soviet system and were now uh, democratizing and the the ambit uh, of that embrace would have also to some 
uh, uh, included Russia, uh, should Russia uh, reach the appropriate level of uh, uh, democratic reforms that were required. Don't forget uh, George H.W. Bush as uh, Secretary of State, uh, 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 James Baker, and he was no longer Secretary of State when he said this, so, and he was hardly alone, so it's no reason why Russia should be excluded from uh, joining uh, NATO. Um, so it, but it was a liberal project more than it was a strategic pro project, which tells you, I guess, something uh, that, that the, what the Russians felt most aggrieved by uh, in not being invited to join was not so much the physical threat to their security, but the threat to their ontological security. They were othered by a Western liberal community uh, that saw them as somehow the adversary. And they, to, if you want to blame NATO enlargement for, for losing Russia, then uh, it, that's probably where the finger of, of, of guilt should be, should be pointed. If there's some NATO solution in the future uh, to the Russia problem, it could be once uh, Putin has been uh, either eliminated through uh, assassination or through coup uh, or somehow replaced, uh, reopening the debate uh, that took place in the early 1990s if uh, Russia could somehow be brought within NATO. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, that sounds shocking at the moment. No one in the red mind would confidence bringing Russia back into NATO. But there was a time when uh, it, would not, it would not have been foreseeable that Germany, Nazi Germany, could, could become an ally of Western countries. Uh, and yet 10 years after the war, uh, Nazi, uh, former Nazi Germany that uh, had become indeed, uh, uh, not just an ally of uh, Western countries, but one of the strongest allies of Western countries. So things in international politics happen in a surprising way. And I, and I wouldn't uh, uh, necessarily uh, uh, exclude something happening on the NATO front politically that could solve the problem, but it can't happen until Vladimir Putin is uh, eliminated from the scene, however that might occur. I won't touch on the other two issues uh, that you mentioned, the 1994 Budapest Memorandum and, and Crimea, because I've already used more than enough time on the 1990s. So. Luca? Oh. Well, I, uh, I can restate what I, what somehow I tried to convey early, that the Italians uh, always uh, somehow privileged the idea of cooperative relations with Russia. And this certainly goes back to the, to the days of the Soviet Union. It goes back to the transition years of 1989, 1991. Although unlike Germany, that David mentioned, Italy was not part of these major debates and negotiations. The process that brought Germany to unification when maybe the Russians argued these initial promises were made, it was uh, the so-called four plus two process that somehow was finalized in, uh, in Ottawa. And Italy felt somehow not let's say humiliated, but in a sense clearly downgraded by its exclusion from these negotiations. Although Italy was not one of the signatory of the so-called Postum Conference or Postum Agreement, and he had no legal right for, for that participation. So Italy didn't make certainly any form of promise to the Soviet Union or to Russia, but he strove to create like cooperation. And let, let's not forget in the 1990s, when NATO first deployed like forces in, in Bosnia, both Ukrainian and Russian forces in the context of the Partnership for Peace, were able to make their contributions. Even in Kosovo, although maybe the situation was already like turning towards a more, let's say, tense relationship between, between the two sides, there was a participation of, of Russian forces somehow to the, to the K4 operations conducted after, after the NATO bombing of Yugoslavia. And then uh, the, the love affair between uh, Berlusconi and Putin, and uh, with Berlusconi somehow certainly not very rationally saying, uh, you should be NATO, you should be in the European Union, so this is certainly like a long-term, I would argue, Italian aspiration. They want to create a truly inclusive pan-European security system. Back in those days, the narrative was a one that would stretch from uh, Vancouver to Vladivostok. And I, I think Italy was certainly not, not have opposed, not have objected this. Now things have, have certainly changed now with the, with the current dynamics, especially maybe not only with Crimea 2014, but also with the Russian intervention in Georgia in, in 2008. And uh, the Italians have already perceived, I would argue, maybe a, a, they perceive a degree of NATO disengagement back in those days. I'm not sure how much they are convinced that the United States are willing now to fully re-engage in Europe. And certainly now the prospect of uh, building up bridges with this Russia, they seem to have uh, sort of evaporated for the, for the time being. So for now, I would be more skeptical about Italy pursuing at this very moment dialogue with the Kremlin, but I, I still believe that this will remain a long-term systemic interest for Italy 
to avoid the risk that persisting tension with Russia may somehow reverberate in the Balkans, may reverber reverberate in the Eastern Mediterranean, and as we saw in Libya or the Sahel, may reverberate in Africa. So for the Italians, there is no long-term solution to this crisis, to a diplomatic solution. And as much as they may dislike now the Putin regime, I think uh, a good degree of realism will lead Italian decision makers to look for diplomatic rather than military solution to the conflicts and not to marginalize at least the Russian people for good. Thank you, Luca. Joe. Well, as uh, Joshua Schifferson said in an article, deal or no deal, um, we're still debating this. Um, and even the people who were there in the 1990s running foreign policy can't seem to agree on uh, what the purpose of enlargement was. Um, uh, others, George F. Kennan condemned it at the time. Mearsheimer has come, came out against it uh, at the time. Um, it was either a, uh, an act of American imperialism to complete and continue dominance of Europe. It was either misguided liberal Wilsonian internationalism, uh, as David you know, suggested, or it was a shrewd move knowing that one day uh, Russia would uh, uh, change its mind and come back at these countries. And now we're in a better position than we would have been had you had some sort of cordon sanitaire uh, between, uh, uh, between, uh, between, the, between the two. Efforts were made to incorporate Russia, as Luca says, the Partnership for Peace, the, the NATO-Russia Council. Um, but I think in the long run, you could never have Russia in a NATO, which was dominated by the West and by the United States. It just wouldn't work. Um, so we are where we are because uh, interests were reconciled. At the same time, um, uh, as NATO enlarged, the vast numbers of Western European or American troops did not pour into these. You know, you have some people arguing we are where we are because we were too weak or we are where we are because we were too belligerent uh, toward Russia. But you can't have it both ways. Or maybe you can. Um, uh, but, you know, it's either we didn't do enough or we did too much. Uh, and so... Uh, I agree with David, it's, in, it's a second, second guesses and uh, it's not encouraging that even the people we relied on to implement these policies can not agree on what they were doing at the time. Thank you, I think we have time for one last round. So I, I've taken a look at the questions we have left and I'm not gonna do justice to, to each and every one of them, but I think there are a lot of people who are curious about what Russia will do next. Right, and it's difficult to look in, in a crystal ball. And I know historians and political scientists are reluctant to do that. But you know, will Russia seek to weaponize oil and gas is something that one attendee is, is asking. Uh, is there anything that will satisfy Russia's security concerns henceforth? What can we expect from Russia more broadly speaking? And then when it comes to NATO, a lot of people are asking, why NATO intervened in other places, uh, you know, Kosovo, Afghanistan, Libya, Iraq, but it's proving uh, unwilling to intervene in Ukraine. And so if you can provide your insights onto why uh, NATO is, is holding back and really just focusing on the security concerns of its own member states, while bilaterally, bilaterally individual NATO countries are supporting uh, Ukraine by providing uh, military equipment and uh, and weapons, and certainly there's coordination amongst ally when it comes to economic and financial instruments to sanction uh, Russia. So uh, that last question is more about about NATO and why it's unwilling to intervene directly in military terms in in Ukraine. Uh, we'll go the other way around. So let's start with you, Joel, this time. Well, I think it's the risk of a larger war, which would, uh, that's fundamentally what's going on in the other places, that risk wasn't present. Um, and, you know, the question you always ask students, uh, is it 1939 or is it 1914? Uh, if you do too much, will you get a bigger war? If you do too little, will you get a bigger war? Um, and I think, but fundamentally now, it's risk of a larger war at a time when none of the allies um, including the United States is, uh, is prepared for one. Uh, and that I think it, uh, explains it. On the other hand, uh, having reached agreement that you're not gonna escalate, you've actually provided a foundation for greater unity on the steps you can take. Uh, and that, that has been a plus. 
Thank you, Joel. I, I agree. And I am also very grateful of the concise nature of your, your response since it's already 1255. Uh, Luca. Uh, tough to say what the Russians want. And uh, certainly they will try to join uh, Crimea with Donbass, I believe. Whether they want to take the whole of Ukraine, uh, well, I would have said no a few weeks ago, but certainly now I may have to maybe at least partly reconsider my answer. And uh, but this is a very, very difficult question and one that maybe would require deep knowledge of dynamics within the Kremlin or the system within Russia. And uh, about NATO's intervention and, and comparisons, well, again, certainly as Joel said, now there is the risk of a larger war, but let's not forget those interventions somehow, they took place within maybe not a broad, a broad international, but a, a broad regional consensus. Russia didn't object to NATO's intervention in Bosnia. Russia didn't certainly support NATO's intervention in Kosovo, but somehow then was involved in the K4 operation. When Libya occurred, Russia and China also took a position, certainly not one of support, but not one of open opposition. Now instead there is the risk of a direct confrontation be between, between NATO and Russia. And certainly we are op operating outside, I would say, a shared international framework. The risk is that what will come out after this, as David said, will be something much more dramatic than the consequences of 9-11. We may be moving towards a new international, not order, but disorder, and one in which China may be certainly looking and taking a clear, let's say, note of what is happening in Europe, maybe to take some initiatives. I'm not, not gonna say which ones, because I think they've been largely debated in these days in, in the Far East. And if we look yesterday, and I'll, I'll finish it here, uh, they're voting within uh, the United Nations General Assembly. I would say the 35 countries, roughly, that, that have abstained, they are certainly representing a consistent part of the non-Western world that should make at least Europe and the United States worry that this may be the beginning of a transformative period in international politics, international relations, regardless of how far the Russians go in Ukraine. I certainly, Putin will demand Ukrainian neutrality. So what will happen to NATO enlargement after this? I, I think it remains pretty much up in the air. Yes, and what will happen also to uh, UN Security Council dynamics henceforth now that Russia is seen as a pariah of the international system. David, you've got the final word. Uh, yeah, I'll just back up what Joel said about why isn't NATO uh, uh, in the skies or over Ukraine right now or on the ground? And the obvious reason, uh, if Iraq and Serbia had nuclear weapons, uh, there probably would not have been the interventions that we saw in 2003 and 1999. If Russia didn't have nuclear weapons today, there would be NATO conventional forces uh, in Ukraine. What Russia wants, I mean, I, who knows? I, I, uh, it's it's uh, foolish to ask professors, uh, even if they're not based in Kingston, what Russia wants. What I think Russia will end up with is less than what it wants and what it will end up with probably the kind of Ukraine that you, uh, Luca has just ex, uh, described, a, a, short, a smaller Ukraine. Uh, than the one that currently exists. So Russia has uh, achieved uh, dominance in the east and in the south of the country. The, the price of, of, of getting Kiev might be a little too much. Uh, people forget, I mean, the Russians yesterday said that the defense ministry has said, well, we've lost 500 soldiers dead and 1,600 wounded. When the Russians say that, that means that they're probably in agreement with the Ukrainian uh, stats, which say that the Russians in the first week of fighting lost 5,000 dead and uh, close to 10,000 wounded. Now think about that. In one week, if the Ukrainian figures are right, Russia has uh, suffered more combat fatalities in one week in Ukraine than the US did in Iraq in two decades, right? Uh, so Putin might want a lot, uh, but uh, life is, uh, is, is tough. You have to settle for what you can get. And uh, I think he's found that the price of trying to get all of Ukraine is gonna be a bit too exorbitant. Ukraine could end up like Germany after the Second World War. We have our part of Ukraine and they have their part of Ukraine. But I don't think our part of Ukraine will stay uh, demilitarized for long. Uh, it's not demilitarized, no. Uh, I think eventually it will be brought into the alliance. Thank you. Thank you, professors uh, Ratsi, Sikorsky, and, and Haglen for the, for the pivot and for addressing the, the issues that we're also focused on uh, today. Um, thank you for sharing your expertise and for the dynamic discussion. I also want to 
uh, pay a special nod to to our audience. Uh, you know, since we've been doing these webinars online, I can't remember a time where we've had so many questions. So thank you for being so engaged. And my apologies to those we weren't able to get to. Thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, please join us next week as well as we'll have our US Visiting Defense Fellow Colonel Pillai give a presentation. And for now, farewell and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.